Uh, I have to admit, I'm feeling a bit strange here trying to face a live audience because for the past two years I've been only been doing webinars. So just feeling a screen was so much more comfortable and easier. It almost feels like my first lecture all over again. So bear with me and let me take you through. So we're going to be doing three presentations today. Uh, I have two other uh, amazing lighting designers with me, Manav and Linus. So we're doing three parts of lighting design, the science, the art, and then the overall contribution of the lighting designer. I'll be talking about the scientific aspects of lighting design, and uh, Mana will talk about the art, and then Linus will come and give a complete holistic perspective about the whole aspect of lighting design. So lighting designer bringing science to design. The aim of this presentation is to revisit this really uneasy relationship that is there between science and design. Now, what I'll try and do is to first uh, ask, uh, make, make, uh, give a simple explanation about the human responses to light. Now, we as human beings experience light, and how we experience light determines the whole aspect of lighting design. So it's very important to understand these basic fundamentals about human responses to light. Then I'll talk about the, uh, identifying some appropriate terminology. There's a lot of terminology that is being used. Some of it sounds a lot more like marketing gimmicks than anything else. So it's very important as architects and designers to identify what is the correct terminology, the appropriate terminology, and then try to differentiate between the inappropriate ones. And finally, talk about making scientific progress that is uh, uh, more uh, usable and visible through lighting design. So what are the human responses to light? The first and the foremost human response to light is about a visual response. Now, we all talk about light levels. Now, I'm, when I'm going to a lot of project meetings, uh, a lot of times I've been told, what is the lux level that is being achieved in a space? Now, we need to understand that we've, uh, we've studied elementary physics about light. Light always travels in straight lines. But a straight line doesn't necessarily mean light is only traveling downwards. Light also travels in straight lines in, in a forward manner. So there is horizontal illuminance that is light that is falling from the ceiling on the floor. Then there's vertical illuminance that is light that is falling on a vertical surface. And there is cylindrical illuminance because light travels in straight lines. Straight lines means straight lines diagonally, straight lines in, a, in, a, in every possible manner. So light hits you from all three dimensional directions. So that is what it is. Now, the other issue is, what is the idea of understanding lux levels? The idea of just looking at lux levels, which is the horizontal illuminance, is the image on the left. If you see the image on the left, the floor is very well illuminated. There's a very um, high amount of lux levels. But this still doesn't sp appear as illuminated as the image on the right. The image on the right looks much more brighter because there's a lot of vertical illuminance. The walls are being illuminated. And it's practical whenever we enter into a space. Do we walk into the space looking at the floor? No, we don't. We, lo we walk into a space looking at what is all around us. So vertical illuminance is more important. The spherical or the cylindrical or the three-dimensional illuminance is a lot more important than just the lux level. So next time when you're into a meeting, when they say talk about just lux level, as architects and designers, it's very important to ask the other question as to what is the vertical illuminance that is being used in a space? Because that's what is going to make your space visible. It's not just lux levels are important, but not, they're not everything in a space. So that is your first visual response to light. And the next visual response is about light quality, which is your light spectrum. Now, if you see these images, both these are white spaces. But there's a marked differential quality between the image on the left and the image on the right. The image on the left looks a very warm space. One is because of the tones that are being used. And if you notice, the light that is being used, the quality of light, it's a very warm, yellowish tinged light. And the light that is coming in from the window, it's an, after, it's an evening sun. So evening sun is generally tends to be much more warmer. So the space has a very cozy and warm feel to it. The image on the left, it's a much more cooler space. But maybe it's more, more applicable for a more 
a formal kind of a setting rather than a cozy setting. So the light quality is determined by the light spectrum, which is the, the warmness or the coolness of the light. So that is your visual response. The next response that we need to be very concerned about is a biological response. Now what does biology got to do with light and what does it have to do with lighting design? It has a very intrinsic relationship. The first thing is, uh, there is a technological term which is called neuroendocrine response. In very simple terms, your brain and your hormones are connected. And how are they connected? It's because in, within your brain, there is a small gland right in the center. It's called the pineal gland. What does the pineal gland do? It produces a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is, in very simple terms, is a sleep hormone. It puts you off to sleep. And how does it get activated? And how does it relate to light is whenever there's no light in a space, your melatonin starts getting activated. So your daily, daily diurnal or circadian rhythms is determined by light. So if you notice, we have 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. And that's how your diurnal, your body clock is working. So whenever the sun sets and it starts getting dark, your melatonin your pineal glands get active, it starts producing melatonin and puts your body to sleep. And why is the melatonin very important is because all your rest of your hormones, be it your, your, uh, your uh, activity, your, um, it, 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 is, it has so many uh, like anti-inflammatory uh, uh, properties and it makes you feel a lot more easier. It cools down the rest of your hormones, it puts your entire body to rest, it rejuvenates your body, it makes you better for the next day. So all of these cycles get disturbed with light. So you need to have the right kind of light at the right moment, at the right timing, so that your body gets activated and deactivated with this diurnal cycle. And that's where this design of light quality comes into play. Now, we all know there is warm light, we all know there is cool light. A lot of times in marketing terms, they call it the yellow light and the white light. But as a designer, I would uh, strongly recommend all of you to use the warm and the cool because that has a lot more correct and meaning to it. What warm light does is it relaxes your body. Although it has a effect on melatonin levels, but warm light tends to not disturb your melatonin cycle. So that's why in the evenings, it is recommended that you're sitting more in a warmer light, but it's not, it doesn't mean that cool light is bad. Cool light is really good because it stops your melatonin levels. So especially when you're working in an office and, if, and you've had a very a heavy lunch and you're feeling a bit drowsy and sleepy, it's very good to switch on your cooler lights because cooler light suppresses your melatonin levels, your body becomes to function better, you're able to focus on your work. So that's how you have all these cycles going within your body when you have your warm light and your cool light and helps you bring bring in more concentration that's why it says that for reading it's always good to use a cooler light because it improves your concentration levels suppresses your melatonin it improves visual acuity you can concentrate better on your uh, space that's the use of using warm and cool light and that's your biological response of light and finally there is a behavioral response within the human beings it's called Neurobehavioral response, in simple terms, is your nervous systems determine your behaviors. How does this all relate to light? Now, within our, there are a lot of systems that are there within our nervous system, but the two primarily consist of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic system, nervous system, it's more like your fight or your flight response. So whenever you're in a situation where either I have to, it's a dangerous situation, either I have to fight or flight, that's when your sympathetic nervous system comes into play. And what happens then is your pupils get dilated because you need to take in more light. And then there is a parasympathetic nervous system, which is more like your rest and relax, a feed and breathe system. So it's more you're relaxing and your pupils become smaller. So there's less light that is needed. So if you notice, Pupils, there's another point where your pupils dilate and contract is when there's more light, your pupils come contract. When there's less light, your pupils dilate. So again, light has a very strong imp influence on your neural, your parasympathetic and your, nervous, and your sympathetic nervous system.
and how does this affect is because now with the whole uh, idea of um, embodied illumination and light following your body bodily motions it has a lot of meaning because this was a very interesting installation that was done in uh, it's called a breath of light and how it works is that the moment you you blow into the light the light illuminates and it comes down and when you move your physical body your the light changes so your behavior is determined by light with this kind of modern technology moving on to the inappropriate and the appropriate uh, terminology that is going to be used in lighting one of the most inappropriate terminology that is used is called human centric lighting why do i call it inappropriate is because it's a very hollow term it's more used like an exaggerated health claims to gain social credibility and to gain consumer comfort now it's very tenuous to use this term because now that you've noticed just because a light can change color temperature from warm light to cool light doesn't necessarily mean is human centric there has there has to be a specific timing there has to be a specific duration of using warm light and cool light you, you can't be using warm light and cool light at your own uh, whims and fancies so that's why it's very important to use these terms in a very uh, correct manner so as designers i would encourage you to be skeptical of any product that they comes without any kind of uh, um, reviewed outcomes to just believe that is human centric lighting so what is the more appropriate term to use integrative lighting now integrative lighting is a term suggested by the commission of illumination in from france and what it says is that you need to elicit the right visual the right biological and the right behavioral response to get an integrative lighting solution and integrative lighting is used for manipulate spatial and temporal spaces now i'd like to uh, highlight this cafeteria example this cafeteria was built inside a basement so there was no uh, a, 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 a scope of bringing in natural light so what did the lighting designer do there was a very beautiful lake overseeing this cafeteria on the outside so the lighting designer took a photograph of that a panoramic image of that caf of that cafeteria that lake and take took a screen printing on that and it was illuminated backlit with leds which have this combination of warm and cool light and there was a sensor that was placed on the outside which senses what's the outside light and the inside light simulates the actual outside atmosphere so when it's warm light outside the cafeteria becomes warm on the outside in, um, in the inside when it's cooler light that's how it brings in that so that is a correct way of bringing in warm and cool light into the space which is time to perfection to natural light which i wouldn't say replicates but somehow tries to mimic natural light what is inappropriate is to just call anything that is sustainable lighting because i've seen a lot of times that just 10 years back cfl or compact fluorescence were considered a very sustainable solution only to be found out that that compact fluorescence contain a lot of gaseous mercury which can be a very poisonous substance and very hard to dispose of leds are considered sustainable more sustainable than incandescent lamps again you need to understand that incandescent lamp is probably the one of the most environmentally friendly because it doesn't have any poisonous disposal it's just it's just glass which can be recycled it's got aluminum which can be recycled on the other hand leds do have a whole bunch of poisonous substances so just calling something sustainable on the basis of energy saving is not the correct terminology to use so what is sustainable sustainability the actual meaning is to meet the needs of the present without compromising the future so sustainable lighting would be to promote and protect nature's health and with high quality designs and one of the biggest problem that i see with sustainable lighting is light pollution all oh, this image is not uh, visible correctly i think is there a resolution problem well anyway so anything that is for it's a conservation method which is used for reducing chemical life cycle and sky pollution that is caused by light so what would be the evolutionary way forward for designers is to work on scripting storyboarding and simulating so science is not just about looking into terminology every design starts from a script because we as designers we need to transition from spatial designers to experienced designers because we are giving an experience to our users 
And that really requires who are understanding the players, understanding their acts within a space, and script it, storyboard it, simulate it, and try to understand how the user would behave in a space. And a designer's obligation is to move from a, towards a bright and a right future. And that would involve thinking through a product. So whenever you pro specify a product, map its entire life cycle right from the time it's produced in a factory to where it's being supplied, how it's being consumed, whether it can be reused, whether it can be recycled. Minimal amount goes into a landfill and comes back to reuse. So thinking, mapping, and specifying is what would be a designer's way forward. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.